Okay, so welcome in, welcome to week two, technically, right? Our first week of lecture, but week two of um, AFS 212, uh, the uh, Intro to Comparative Ethnic and Global Societies. So welcome in. Um, if you've never taken a course with me before, uh, the one thing that I always start off with in all of my classes is just asking how we're doing. So we always start there. How are you? How is everyone adjusting to this to the semester? How are you doing? Let's see. Doing pretty good, to be honest. Yeah. Just a little bit hard to schedule uh, a proper like classes since um it's a little weird right now. Yeah, I'm sure. Can we get the, the rest of his cameras on? I see a couple of folks that are still cameraed off. But if you didn't watch the week one welcome video, you don't know that I am going to start removing folks from the room just because I, I'm just really tired of also being on Zoom, but by myself on Zoom. Everyone wants to turn their cameras off and then it's just me talking to a bunch of blank screens. It's not fun. Okay. All right, so I'm checking the chat. Doing a little, doing all things, all right. Doing all right, all things considered. Okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah, can't complain too much about that, right? A little frustrated we're not in person. Hmm. Well, here we are. Make the best of situations. It's a bit challenging, hanging in there, doing fine, burnt out. Burnt out, it's only week two. What's going on? Why are we burnt out? Well, I had to, um, I'm also doing winter classes that um, mm. are overlapping into spring, so that's why. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Well, mind your self-care. Mind your self-care. School is not more important than your health. Okay, so let's check in with the world. What's going on in the world around us? Give me some news. What's happening out there? Florida is passing dumb laws. I'm gonna need you to be more specific than that. Um, I saw that they passed the uh, um, where you can't make white people uncomfortable or something like that, and the uh, anti-gay in like schools law, I think. Oh or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, why is that the the news that imp is important for you to bring up first? Well, because like the you can't make white people uncomfortable law, it's like. It's targeted towards minorities like you can talk about race and like i think if you do you they could like press charges or something like that like as a minority you can't just like that's like that's like breaking like the uh, one of the amendments and like white people are already like like the majority like they have it better in life so this is just like making it worse for minorities and better for them okay and so a topic like that is not only relevant to what we're going to be talking about here right but these are things that are happening all the time. And whether or not we know it, right? These are laws that are always being kind of slipped under the radar. So for example, uh, like critical race theory is, is one that's been under fire a lot in the last couple of years. Um, I believe that I have us reading that. If I don't have us reading that, then I'll drop it for y'all to read if you want to um, on your own time. It's a book everybody should read anyway, but right, we should be aware of um, particularly things that are happening with um, educational institutions or anything that is specifically targeting minoritized folks, right? Because at the end of the day, that is going to be us. And even if it doesn't impact us directly, at some point it could, right? Um, so there's no new laws under the sun. So every law that we allow to be passed is ultimately becoming a platform for other laws. So let's say that, um, let's say that schools were to go ahead and ban uh, critical race theory, for example. What other types of uh, knowledge can then be banned based off of that? What do you think? I mean, you could go down the list of, as far as like um, whitewashing certain, <clears throat> certain atrocities that um, either this country itself has committed or 
um, keeping people from learning about um, learning about certain figures or certain organizations in history, um, particularly people who are uh, black or brown. Sure, exactly, right? And so think about this Florida example, right? What else can this lead to? Um, we could lose our, I don't know how to say, our voice, we can lose our voice and we won't be able to speak out opinions anymore because all a white person can say like, oh, you, that's offensive and you're offending me. And we would just lose our freedom of speech as well. Yeah, right. And so now you're starting to tread on other quote unquote freedoms that we're supposed to have, right? That are not necessarily written in stone anyway. So like folks like to bring up the first amendment. Well, the first amendment is not all inclusive. Right? That's how things like this can get passed in the first place. It's not an all inclusive law. You cannot just say whatever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want, right? And so that gives space for that ambiguity for things like this to open up. So good, that's a great example to start with. Excellent job. Uh, give us one more. What else is happening out there in the world that we should be aware of? Trump is trying to run for president in 2024. And I think he also said that he would forgive the people that rioted against the, the Capitol in January last year. I was like, are you serious? You just you just wanted to start my Monday off like this is what I'm is what I'm hearing. Okay, so talk to us about this. Why does this matter? It matters because we've clearly seen that he's not really fit to be president or he doesn't take the job very seriously. When you say not fit or doesn't take the job seriously, give us concrete examples of that. What have you seen? Uh, I saw a news article that pulled out like evidence that he and Sinner, like he, ca I don't, he caused the riot. He kind of like told the supporters to like, go and attack the Capitol. I'm okay. like, a, pre a president doesn't do that. So in your understanding of what a president is and what the functionality of that position is, um, why, why does that matter? Like, what is a president to you? What are they supposed to do? Well, a president is someone that's supposed to like take care of the country and its people and um, be an equal ruler, so not favorite one side, but be equal to everyone. And you shouldn't be pinning people against each other, which I think that's something he does. He's he's against a lot of people of color and you should be all inclusive. And that's what a president does. You don't discriminate a minority because you're ru not ruling, but like you're in charge of everyone. Not, you don't pick and choose. Okay, so you aspire to have a leader who cares about you as a person, who is not going to um, openly and actively discriminate against you or make your life unnecessarily harder. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. What else? Give us some other ideas. What do you expect out of your leaders? Someone new, what do you expect out of your leaders? What do you expect out of that presidential position? Uh, I think for me personally, I would expect a strong role model. Like I think Trump has, has you know, done some good and bad things. I'm not gonna be any specific to like, you know, cause anything controversial, but I do think he's been a poor role model as he obviously has made his stance clear in very certain topics. I think at times he's been a little too aggressive and that's why a lot of people don't like what he says or does because he's not showing a really good like he's not being a very kind role model as many would like to look towards as a U.S. president. Okay I'm going to push back on what you said just a little bit and it's the idea of uh, you not wanting to be controversial. They don't have any problem with being controversial right so we have to have less of a problem with being controversial as well. The reason is the controversy is where all of our concrete examples lie, 
right? We can't effectively say, well, you're not a good leader, but I don't want to say why because it's controversial, but also we've seen X, Y, and Z uh, in like a very broad sense, right? That is, um, this is one of the places where a lot of our conversations around uh, Trump in particular have fallen short or have fallen on deaf ears, right? We're not willing to engage because we're also a little bit afraid of that controversy. So in, in my classes, this is one of the things that I push back on with you all a lot. Don't be afraid of the controversy, stand into it. We have to stand into it because that's where all of our concrete examples lie for how this oppression and, and how these oppressive systems and cycles continue to function. So uh, you don't have to go back and say anything additional in this this time, but uh, just, just a note for y'all, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, y'all get that. Okay, cool. All then, right. Um, if, if I could add on mm -hmm. to that. Um, sure. I think going back to, I believe it was Evelyn, um, which, well, when you when you asked her a question as, as far as what an American president should be, um, if, if, if anything, Trump embodied everything that an American president should be in the sense that he is a mega capitalist, uh, you know, imperialist, um, all of these horrible things, which are deeply embedded into, into, uh, you know, the foundation of this country essentially is, is what he embodied. So if, if there is ever, if there was ever like a perfect American president, it was it's probably Trump. <laughs> not, not that isn't to say that I'm condoning him in any way, but that is what that is what he and his base represents. Isaiah, right? Yeah, you and I are gonna get along real well. I agree <laughs> so much with that sentiment because if we really think about the development of the country, right, and who it was developed for, it was not developed for us. This, the laws and the constitution and everything that was developed was to protect white men, the elite white men, right, and their property which was everyone, their wives, their slaves, everything, right? So we have to keep that in the context too. Remember that none of those things have ever been updated or adjusted, right? Just a couple of amendments to the constitution here and there, but really they're, they fall moot in some places. And we'll talk about that throughout the semester also. Um, but in general, right, I, I do agree with that sentiment that if there was ever a perfect American president, that guy is it, right? That's the, the American dream right there. Right. When we talk about why it's not accessible to us, that's why it mm -hmm. was never written for us in the first place. So we're definitely going to lean into that uh, throughout the semester. So thank you for uh, setting that preface for us. Mm -hmm. All right. So apparently we're going to have some real good conversations already. I love this. Um, before we jump into the lecture, let's just do some housekeeping real quick. Um, if you have not watched the week one welcome videos, please do, it, it's imperative, please, that you watch these week one welcome videos. Uh, the first video, let me, let me flip my camera so I can show y'all where everything is just so that you have this in yet another space. Try to be as thorough as possible for everyone. All right. So up at the top of your band feed, you'll see things that are pinned at the top as a notice. This one isn't your band, let me go into yours. Okay, so same setup, right? Everything's pinned to the top as a notice. Here's the week one intros, right? And welcome to the new community members. In the welcome to the new community members, you have a welcome video that is posted here that goes over the course in depth. I go over the whole syllabus, everything that we're gonna be doing. So please make sure that you check this out. I also added, uh, once I got your calendar up, I also added a video that goes specifically. Your mic cut out. It cut out your mic. You're it's muted. Apparently the do not disturb feature on my phone does not want to work. So <laughs> every time I get a call in, I lose my voice. Uh, so if that ever happens, please just let me know and I'll go back. Um, so this video here, goes over your band specifically and goes through all the features, the calendar, um, the posts and responses, 
everything so you can see it um, and know exactly how to do it. Uh, I'm bringing this up because all of these have to get moved or you're not going to get your points. So I tried to, uh, I tried to like get folks to see that earlier. I tried to get them to see it again. I tried with the, um, the video uploads, but uh, many of you are trying to just wing it. And don't tell me you're not because I was a student in Dominguez also. I know how it goes. Some of y'all are just trying to wing it. Uh, don't do that. Watch the video so you know exactly how things function because I promise you it's so simple once you get things moving. I've tried to make it as intuitive as possible also so there shouldn't be a lot of like back end trying to figure shit out. So if you do have any specific issues or, or problems or questions though, that's what you have that community chat room for. Uh, so put your questions in there just in case I'm not available. Uh, somebody else who may have an answer to your question can absolutely answer that for you. Any questions so far on that? No, I was very, just Pamela, <clears throat> Pam speaking. I was one of those ones who posted under the post. Wing. Uh -huh. yeah, no, I wasn't trying to wing it. I watched that video like, this is my first time being in school. And I, when uh -huh. I say years, I mean years. I went to okay. the like way, 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 way long time ago. So Welcome I just, back. I, it, whew, I should have been back. But however, I'm here. Thank God. But I was one of the ones who posted under that. But then I went this morning after watching that video like three times. I'm like, I've seen her do this. Let me get it together. But I posted it on the right one today. Hopefully it's correct. So I was definitely one of those ones. <laughs> Let me check for you right now. It's, it's gonna say. Um, uh, also, you have your you have your ID as your name on here. You don't have to do that. You can you can put your regular name on here. Oh, okay. Good. All right, I'll change it. It said there's someone named uh, uh, I think Gabby, and there was another person. I think I did it correctly when I uh, changed it over. I gotta see what your number is. One hundred two eight one hundred two. Okay, so I see you. Um, Yep, you have a peer response under Gabby. And then someone else under her. And you have one okay. under, uh-huh. Okay, oh, it was. Yeah, so you've got those two there. So then it's your initial post also has to get put under here. So if you want, I don't mind sitting um, and screen sharing with you and showing you exactly how to do it also. So if those videos are not helpful, that's fine too, right? So I don't mind sitting and making sure that everyone knows how to do everything. You mean the initial post that I put there on the other one? No, no I did, I copied and pasted. I just added a little bit more. Yeah. It's okay. gonna, I added so I the part about Gabby. And then under there, it's going to say, My name is Pam Kirkwood. And then I attended Dominguez like 19, I mean, 19, I almost threw it out there. <laughs> but it's going to tell you the year that I, I mean, not the year, but when I attend, that I attended, I'm a returning student, that type of thing. Okay. But I, I just copied and pasted, just added a little more to it. Okay. Well, I'll make it a point after we get off here to, to check it out for you and make sure everything is, is cool. All right. Good. I'm, I'm getting there, but it's going to be blue. But that's okay. That's okay. That's why we do this, right? We like to make sure that we've got that buffer time to make sure everyone is acclimated, make sure everyone knows how to do everything. But once you get into a routine, this should run like clockwork for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Wait, so we're not supposed to post it under the question that you gave us, but in the, like, another? No, no, no. So everything gets put right underneath of the post for that week. Oh, okay. So like everything that we, that you were responding to for week one goes under the week one post. Um, oh, okay. so that was why I didn't week put, one introduction? Correct, right. Okay. So I didn't put the week two post up yet because I wanted to um, have this time with y'all just to make sure that everyone was clear about what was going on. Um, so you'll have your week two post up later today. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Any other questions, concerns? Uh, should we just delete the post that we made then on accident? If you want to, the thing is nobody's going to scroll through to find it. You know what I mean? So that's why yeah. it becomes like just overpowering to the feed, just mm -hmm. like any other social media, right? You, you lose posts every now and again because they just get shoved far down. So that's why yeah. I try to keep everything under the post that we're actually working on. Uh, so yeah, so you can, or you can keep it there. It doesn't make much of a difference. Nobody's really going to go scroll through to find it. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay, cool. All right, so we have, 
we have about 45 or so. All right, so let's have a candid conversation about privilege. All right, first of all, what is privilege? What does this mean? What do y'all think? What do you think privilege is? A special advantage over other people or like an advantage you have yeah, over you others? Can, yeah, you can look at it like an advantage that you have over others, right? Particularly one that doesn't necessarily impact you. So you don't really have to think about it, right? So take a second and really think outside of the box here. Um, what is a privilege that you have? As minoritized folks, we don't really talk too much about the privileges that we have because we're always on the conversation and I'll end up being the oppressed. But the reality is that we also have privilege. So to best understand this concept, let's call it out. What kind of a privilege do you have? Do you benefit from? Being able to go to school and on like scholarships or stuff that they provide for us, like that's what? Sure, yeah, that's a privilege. Right, everybody doesn't have access to that. Sure. Think even more basic than that. What are some real basic things that you have access to that somebody else really has to consider? Um, I would I mean, say. I, oh, oh, sorry. You sorry. can go for it. Um, I would say, um, like knowing English is a privilege. I grew up with immigrant parents, and like they very much struggled with like understanding like. Um, like specific forms or like papers or just English in general and they struggle with that and like I guess growing up here it really is a privilege to know like English like properly. Yes yes that is an excellent example right if you don't know the language that someone else is speaking how are you supposed to function right it's very very difficult to do that um I'm not gonna be looking at the chat too, too much. So if there um, is anything pertinent that shows up in there, someone can just call that out for me, please. Uh, okay, give us another one. What's another example of a privilege that we have or that you do have? The privilege of going to school or having like public schools to be able to attend to? Think even more basic than that. So we, we got the access to education, right? That's absolutely a privilege. Um, access to language and being able to speak whatever is being spoken around you and to understand and function in that, in that language. What um, else? Uh, access to food and water. Sure, yeah. Even in our food insecure areas, right? We still have more access than some areas of the world do, right? If you have a bodega, Somebody in, uh, you know, the a, a jungle, for example, like there are there are um, tribes and things that live in jungles that have not um, adapted with the rest of the world, right? We call them third world or whatever. Um, you have a bodega, you already have more access to uh, foods than that source might have, or that that community might have, right? So yeah, that absolutely is a privilege. It doesn't feel like it. Right, because to think about it like that, it doesn't feel like a privilege. It's like, well, we don't have like access to, to good quality foods all the time. Well, sure, right? But that's not what privilege is necessarily speaking to, right? Privilege is, is really more flat than that. It's really just about things that you have access to or that you benefit from that you don't have to really think about. So think about wheelchair ramps, right? If you're not in a wheelchair, you don't have to worry about where we're wheelchair ramps are. You don't have to worry about whether or not the door to get into your classroom is big enough for you. I've had this issue before on Dominguez campus, by the way, just throwing that one out there. Um, if you are someone who identifies differently on the gender spectrums, bathrooms, I mean, that's been an issue, right? But people never thought about it being a privilege for them to not have to consider what bathroom they would be using, what bathroom is safe for them to use, right? Um, Give us one more example. Give us an example of a privilege that you have. I would say having like a stable house and like somewhere to live and stay. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Right? 
Even if you live in the hood, you can live in the shittiest apartment, but you have an apartment. That's more than somebody's got, right? That's the privilege piece. And so privilege, there's layers to it, right? It's not so cut and dry as if you're privileged then you're a bad person, or if you're privileged then you're uh, superior, you have a superiority complex, right? If you're privileged, that means you're white. No, those things are, they're not interchangeable, right? And so that is going to lead the discussion of how we can embrace both our privileges, right? Because our understanding what our privileges are allow us to advocate for those who, who need access, right? So we have to embrace what our privileges are, but also allows us the space to begin having dialogues about how we dismantle oppressive privileges. Um, so most of your articles this week uh, discussed white supremacy and uh, white privilege. So let's talk about that. In your terms, what is white privilege? Not getting pulled over by the police on a regular basis. Sure, there's an example of white privilege, right? Not being so concerned about when a police officer is nearby or driving behind you. Anybody else be like, so I drive a Mustang. I'm always scared when they're around me because I drive real fast sometimes, but also because my car is loud, but also because black people driving. I mean, let's just talk about it. But when the police get anywhere near me, my body starts to tense up, right? You start having real physical reactions to it, right? Well, why don't white counterparts have that same reaction? It's a privilege that they have. Right? that's rooted in all of the things that we started talking about with what's going on in the world around us, right? The policy changes, um, things that are uh, just rooted in the way that the, the country was established, right? So it's long-term privilege, sure. Okay, what else? Getting a job based on who they know, so what they know. Sure, right? Sometimes access to employment is actually a... Uh, key element in white privilege because it allows for the continuation of these systems, right? To essentially stay how they are. Sure. Give us like a baseline definition. Somebody knew. If you, if someone asked you to give me a one sentence definition of what white privilege is, what would you tell them? I would say not having to worry about things that um, what's it called other groups have to do with kind of like that. Exactly. Right. A real baseline definition is not going to have all of the negative connotations. Right. It's not going to have all of the very um, explicit experiences It's going to be the same as all the other definitions. Right. The baseline understanding is there are things white people don't have to think about and don't have to consider just because they're white. Right. So how do we get all of the negative connotation attached to it in a way that has caused us to not consider our own privileges? What do you think? Where did white privilege take a turn and get all these negative ideas associated with it? We see in um, what's it called a not equal treatment. So we'll see a white person do something and get away with it, but a person of color will do something that's not inherently bad, but they'll get punished for it. So we're seeing that people white people will get away with like killing people and a person of color might like pass a red light and they'll get thrown in jail so we kind of see that um the inequality and kind of see the privilege that they have over a lot of things right so the key difference right the key method of having that attachment right having those negative connotations attached to this idea is action versus in inaction, right? It's action in terms of us experiencing and seeing and hearing over and over and over again, the disparities and the differences in the way one group is treated over another, right? Or over every other group. 
The same group is also considered to be the dominant social group, right? The dominant political group, the dominant economic group. But also these same folks who are the dominant also have more power and control over that change. And so inaction, right? Inaction towards bridging these gaps and creating more uh, sustainable approaches and creating more um, equality and equity and all of that, that doesn't benefit them. So white privilege gets this extra connotation attached to it because of that um, intentional inaction towards change. Does that make sense? And so that's one of the reasons that um, I like to start this class having this, kind of, this candid conversation about what privileges, what white privileges, because all of that feeds to how we have gotten here in the first place. So each of the communities that we're gonna be discussing are impacted by white privilege, both separately and collectively. We can't effectively have that conversation though if we're not even willing to recognize our own privilege because then what it does is it puts this idea of privilege as something that is only white and that's not true because we're gonna see differences within each group as well, right? We're gonna see instances where one group is going to have a privilege that another group doesn't have. We're going to see instances where one group may actually engage in oppressive activities towards other groups as well. Um, and so I want us to keep this in mind because as we are thinking about these, right? The idea of liberation is always gonna be centered to this. It's always gonna be a, our central focus. Sorry. So I've been working multiple jobs, so. Um, but as we're moving forward in these conversations, right? Um, this is how we start to dismantle these systems holistically, instead of just pointing the finger and saying, well, you are what's wrong with everything. Well, primarily we know that the idea of white privilege is the thing that has been wrong with most of these systems, but we have also been indoctrinated to this point and play a part. And so it's important for us to recognize our positionalities. Uh, go ahead, Isaiah. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I think I'm just kind of kind of try to build off of that. Um, sure. It's 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 sort of like the whole like the, like uh, what is it missing the forest for the trees as far as um, and sort of going back to that presidential example of people hyper focusing on Trump and and his administration for all the wrongdoings that that they committed while not extending that analysis broadly to you know, previous presidents or the, the, the American government or the, the, the system in which we exist under as a whole. Um, right. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, right? It, it's all bleeding right back into exactly where we started. Um, and so for me, this is why the, like the construct of the class is the way it is and the way that I do the lectures, right? We put ourselves first, ask each other how we're doing and wait for an answer. Um, if you've noticed, it's socially okay to, or socially expected even, for us to ask someone how they're doing, but it's not considered socially rude or, or unexpected to not wait for an answer or to not actually want an answer. How many times you walk past somebody, you say, how you doing? You don't wait for a response. You just keep walking. You didn't actually want to know. Instead of saying you didn't look rude, right? Well, let's switch that narrative up. Let's change all of these different narratives together. Um, there's a privilege right there, right? The privilege of being able to continue to walk past somebody and just like see through them, right? All right, so what I'm gonna do is, if it will let me, mm, okay, I don't think the app version is gonna let me do it. So I'm going to leave for a second. I'll leave for about five minutes and I want y'all to brainstorm on this idea of privilege. I want you to really think about, um, pull an example or two from the readings that you had um, assigned to you for this week and just really think about this concept of privilege. I want you to think about um, white privilege as its own entity, right? But weigh that against your own privileges, right? How do they measure up? Um, What's beneficial to somebody? Are you actually causing harm to somebody else through a privilege that you didn't recognize before, right? So I want you to think about those things. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna give you until 
Uh, we'll, we'll come back at 147, give about six minutes.
Hey class, I created a group me because I was still having trouble um, using band. So in case you guys want to log into that and we can help each other on that, that would be great. All right, well, it was excessively quiet, so I hope that y'all uh, have some thoughts. Y'all don't like talking to each other? Or what? What does it say in the chat? Yeah, I like the group me, okay. So give me some thoughts. I don't want to talk to each other. So hopefully you at least, you know, look through a reading or something like that. Tell me your thoughts on this idea of white supremacy. Uh, privilege, sorry, white privilege. Can I go? Sure. Okay, so for like what um one main example of like white privileges, I'm like um they're like the beauty standard and like kind of like now it's like changing, but like um like um back then you see like like they were like the main thing, you know, like the pale skin, the color eyes, the blonde hair, the brunette or whatever, and like this will leave all like minoritized people feeling like. Like especially younger people feeling like they didn't fit in or they weren't like beautiful or whatever because they didn't have these Eurocentric features. And if we connect that to like us to minoritized people, like some um some of us have like like the more pale skin or like some we have some of these Eurocentric features. And the ones who do, if they're like in like some families who are like colors or whatever, they usually like prefer them over like the like the darker skinned family members. And like that's like really that's horrible to change yes but that's very true right if we look at the industry the beauty industry we know that the aesthetic standard has always idolized european uh, standards of beauty right and so for some of our communities that have lighter folks or who are still further away from the equator and thus would already naturally be lighter skinned uh if you look like down uh the bottom of like South America, for example, right? They're going to start to get lighter the, the further away from the equator you get, right? Absolutely. We have internalized a lot of these issues. Colonialism certainly didn't help that particular plight. Um, so in Central and South America, right, they recognize something called the Costa system. Has anybody heard of that before? If you've taken a class with Dr. Gutierrez, you definitely have heard of this. So the Costa system, is essentially a, a racialized understanding of people in terms of their skin tone um, and thus their societal standards and expectations. Actually, let me pull it up for you so you can see it. Okay, I'm gonna flip this over. All right, so this is the cost the system here. And so as you can see in each box, right, they start to, you can see the different shades of folks. You can see what they look like in terms of their clothing. You can kind of guess what their positionality in society would be, right? These folks look like they're working more, right? They've got less shoes on as opposed to some other folks. The further down you go, the further down you go, the darker folks are starting to get. See that? I mean, literally some of their names are they don't even understand these folks, right? Because there's a, there's a lack of wanting to understand folks. There's a lack of try because this is all 
um, the ways in which colonialism becomes to be justified in these regions, right? Um, and so this system is essentially 16 shades of blackness um, that is recognized um, from Spain that does not include pure Spanish blood because they would not be part of this system, right? They are the, the ultimate rulers. However, they are also in here in terms of if they were to um, procreate with anyone from these regions. So right on the top of this, um, Right on the top of the system, you can see the Spanish man, right? With an India woman. And so the system is actually based off of the offspring, the child. And so this is the top, top, top that you can be in this sort of a racialized system. Let's look down here at the bottom. All right, we've got the, I don't even understand you. And then look over here, we've got the India woman again, right down at the bottom. So this tells you that you have options in terms of the social hierarchy, depending on who you're willing to engage with, who you're willing to marry. Sometimes that's the access, right? Sometimes that's about the money. Eh. Right, we've got lighter skinned folks are always gonna be closer to the top, right? And so that standard of beauty is not even something that is just um, exclusive to the United States. Hold on, there we go. That standard of beauty is not just exclusive to the United States, but it's something that we have seen um, throughout these histories of colonization as a method of continuing this trend and continuing these systems of domination. So that's absolutely something that we should be uh, thinking about in terms of this conversation. Um, if you haven't seen this series before, there's a wonderful series uh, by Dr. Henry, Henry Louis Gates Jr. Um, on PBS called uh, Black in Latin America. And he goes through uh, different stereotypes and considerations in terms of how people really feel about um, race and skin tone and uh, the impacts of colonization and enslavement and all of that. So highly recommend it if that's uh, an area of your interest in this course. Okay, give us another one. Give us another reflection. So <clears throat> um, one of the things I've been thinking about was in, in terms of privilege, um, just being just being a man, like being a you know cisgendered heterosexual man. Um, yeah. there are lots of things that I don't necessarily have to, that, that don't, aren't things that I have to immediately consider as it pertains to like my safety, you know, women, a lot of, or, or women presenting people, like a lot of the time could be at risk. They potentially can't go to certain areas because it could be threatening to their lives. Um, um. Yeah, I mean, that that's sort of what I've been thinking about as we've been discussing this. Yeah, right. That's an excellent point. And I like the uh, the intentionality that that you're putting in the language that you're using too to um, to really phrase this conversation, right? That it's it's not that you are um, unaware of it, right? or that it only pertains to a certain other type of person, right? Because you also mentioned like female presenting people. And so that absolutely includes like trans women, for example, non-binary folks, um, but simple things even, right? Being able to walk down the street at night. Yeah. You know, every time I take my dog out at night, all of my old uh, male neighbors are like, be careful out there. Mm -hmm. just trying to just let my dog pee, you know, it's not going anywhere crazy. But the, the idea that there needs to be some level of protection just because all right, of the way that I present, mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not those other folks can actually do anything. Yeah. You know, uh, my one neighbor, he's a 60 year old guy. He can barely walk up and down the stairs. If I'm legit in trouble down the street, how long is it gonna take him to get over there to mm -hmm. quote unquote protect? 
You know what I mean? So absolutely. So privilege is not even necessarily a given. It's just something you don't have to think about. Right. Great, great examples. Great examples. Okay. Let's think about these scenarios. I really liked the scenarios that uh, the heteropatriarchy and the three colors of white supremacy started with. So we're going to think through these scenarios. Um, some of this will be difficult to understand because we haven't had a really good conversation about race and what race is. So let's start and see how we go from here. Um, and then after that, we'll have a discussion about race. So the first scenario says, a group of women of color come together to organize. An argument ensues about whether or not Arab women should be included. Some argue that Arab women are white since they have been classified as such in the US census. Another argument erupts over whether or not Latinas qualify as women of color, since some may be classified as white in their Latin American countries of origin and or pass as white in the United States. What are your thoughts on that? Should Arab and Latinas be included in conversations about women of color? I think it opens like this whole conversation because me and my friend had that conversation not that long ago about specifically that how us as like people of color we struggle on like when we take um standardized tests usually ask you for your race and then your ethnicity and it, it usually says at the top it says like latino or hispanic and then at the bottom there's like no latino option is just like white or asian or like pacific islander and stuff like that so we had this conversation about how it's confusing to us because we don't really know what to put mm -hmm. because why are they asking if we're hispanic or latino at the top but there's not like an option on the bottom so and it's also we also talked about the white passing how there's such thing as latino people passing as white having white privilege because if a person were to see them on the street they're white passing so you don't think twice of thinking if they're like a person of color and Correct. he mentioned that just at like eye contact or seeing them on the street you don't think twice if they're like a person of color because based on their appearance they're white passing. So it is really hard for them as they know that they're Latinos or they grew up in like a family of people of color, but they pass as white. I think I lost my train of thought. But yeah, that's that's, okay. that's where I'm that's okay. So from there, right? That's a really good start to this conversation. So from there, why would they choose white? Obviously, so we have ethnicity that's separated out from race every time you select one of them boxes. So folks have to select an ethnicity and also have to select a race. Um, fun fact, if you choose not to for like job applications and that kind of thing, HR is gonna pick it for you because they need it for their internal data. So always self-select. Anyway, um, why would these folks choose white? as opposed to like other, for example. They might think it might benefit them more because they might want to hire them, so like that. Yes, absolutely. There's one key thing right there, right? Benefit, because it benefits people to be able to select white. That's access. More likely to get a call back for sure. What else? Why would someone identify as a person of color, but also select white as their race? It could also be because of like physically white, like an example could be me because I'm Hispanic, but I'm like physically white. So 
They might just do both, I guess. Sure. In a lot of cases, we have been indoctrinated to believe that race is about our skin tone, right? But that is absolutely false. It can't possibly be the end all be all. I mean, I just showed you a whole nother racialized system with 16 different boxes. And we've got what, five? We don't even have enough boxes. And if everybody was about skin tone, if every single race was really about skin tone, then why is only two of them listed as colors? What color is Asian? I don't remember seeing that in the crayon box. Yeah, Asians come in like all sorts of colors like that. Like I have some Asian friends who are very dark and some are very like whiter. So that's true. Yes, absolutely. Right. Like what color is Native American? Right. And so we have to rethink about race also. Um, but yes, most of us select the color that we have been told to select. And if a color doesn't exist, then we've also been pre-designated with a term in its place. Okay. Um, another thing is that a lot of studies have shown that stereotypes play a role in this. So uh, among folks who identify as uh, being Latin American or from Central South America, um, they identify or disidentify with black folks because of the stereotype. So even if they're darker skinned, they will still tend to select white because I mean, socially, right? And uh, with their relationship to Spain in terms of that uh, colonization, right? They know that they don't want to be treated like black folks. So if you don't wanna be treated like black people, it's, and you don't have to identify as a black person, you're definitely not going to. And so most people don't select other either, right? Uh, and specifically, again, talking about folks from Central and South America who are checking off these boxes in the United States. They don't select other either because again, that power dynamic, it's that saying, it, it's like saying, I don't know exactly what I am, but I'm definitely not you. That's what checking other says. Right, checking others says that I don't know what I am, but I'm not you. Um, checking white instead of other is a very clear statement about who you are and what is expected out of you and what you are expecting out of yourself and what society is thus expecting out of you and ultimately should get from you. Does that make sense? Some of y'all look bored. I like to comment on people. Got a couple of people with their cans off. Give me some feedback, talk to me. What do y'all think? It's also, I noticed too, it's like different, different countries too. Like, um, I know in Mexico, um, What's it called? Like, is race kind of seen differently? Like, here when you're yes. like, even if you're like as pale as me, you can be considered Mexican, but like, I have darker skinned friends who are Mexican, and we're just both labeled as the same group, and Mexico it's different. Mm -hmm. So, there's that too. Yeah, because it's not a concept that is exclusive to the United States. I have a friend who uh, lives in Singapore, and she was telling me about the race systems in Singapore and how they basically have four, and it's uh, pure Chinese. Uh, like Chinese Singaporean, um, and then uh, some other class of uh, like randomized local Asian, um, and then another category. They don't even have black on there, right? That's how little of a population it is. So there's also a social reflection in uh, race collections, right? There's a social reflection of who lives here, who are we serving, who is supposed to be here, supposed to be here, right? Who is supposed to be here and who is not. So folks who are coming here from Central and South America are selecting white as a designation of I'm supposed to be here. There's that, right? Little uh, liberation tidbit there. But also, think about it in terms of like uh, power in uh, like how we make decisions in this country, right? Um, most of y'all are being used as a, as a voting ploy, right? Mm -hmm. If all of the minoritized folks in the United States are lumped together under this umbrella term of being a minority, 
how is that possible, right? Numerically, it's not possible. Numerically, we outnumber the quote unquote majority. But when it comes down to uh, the maintenance of power, right, there has to be something that allows those in power um, to demonstrate that control. And so they demonstrate it by creating an idea of a majority. So the idea is created by adding on folks who they don't really have any real intention of helping or caring about or anything of that nature, um, just for the visual aid. Same thing the three-fifths compromise did. Uh, go ahead, Isaiah. Yeah, um, and so I maybe, well, I don't know if I'm off base, but I don't know exactly how this pertains to racial categorization, but um, I know just in my area, um, I, I live in a, like a predominantly like Vietnamese area. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that I definitely remember um, just as far as like going to high school, middle school, from my Vietnamese friends or just hearing it in passing that there is a lot of in 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 a lot of Asian cultures there's there, there there's this this element of like colorism where you know being seen as like a darker skin Asian person is is you are to be less valued than somebody who is much more uh, I guess white or euro looking um which of course stems from colonization and, and imperialism and stuff like that um mm -hmm. but yeah I, I just thought i'd throw that out there yeah so other parts of the world are also impacted by these ideas um so if you if you've been to um any of these other countries right you've you've probably seen some things that folks do to protect their visibility um Common things include skin lightening creams, right? There's a huge market for that. There's a huge, huge market for skin lightening creams in Nigeria. Um, in a lot of Asian countries, there's like the umbrella trend. Folks stay out of the sun as much as possible. They stay out of the sun to maintain the fairness of their skin. And of course, it also helps with other things like uh, decreasing sun damage and skin cancers and all of that. But really, if, if if we wonder why folks are doing it, it's to protect that aesthetic. It's to protect their access to as close to the dominant folks as possible, right? Good, 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 good. All right, so we, we've we seen it, we've we experienced it, we've lived it, and so we get a little bit of it. Let's see. Might add that one into a conversation later. Uh, am I able to continue off what Isaiah said earlier? Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry, I didn't see you there, Kevin. Uh, Y'all no, don't have okay. to raise your hands either. You, you can just uh, unmute and talk if you want. Uh, OK, uh, I like to continue with Isaiah said because I do uh, agree to a very far extent. As a Vietnamese person myself, I'm often not seen as Asian just because I tend to be a darker skin tone had many cases of incidents because I went to a very 50-50 uh, of your Mexican or Vietnamese school, but I was more towards seen as the Mexican side, duly towards mm -hmm. Mexican color. But I think this stems a lot more from our, like our origin country of like Asia, like Vietnam, Yemen and Korea, yeah. China. I believe lighter skin seen seen more as beautiful, more so as like he said, colonization, because the Vietnamese race did get colonized a lot by the French. They did help a lot with our race mm -hmm. like they help develop language a lot of culture actually and hence they seen as probably a higher being i don't know this personally because obviously i wasn't there but this is just my thought as experiencing it personally growing up so sorry real quick did, did you say the, um did you say your friend group consisted more of like other latino students oh yeah for sure i yeah. actually don't have that many asian friends i'm more of like i guess as people see like someone that's friends with more mexicans than asians but that, 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 comes, yeah. that that's that's something that, that now that now that you say it that's something that i've kind of noticed is is a lot of the sort of more uh <clears throat> darker skinned asian people uh that that i would go to school with they, they were much more inclined to um to associate or or or, or be a part of 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 uh it's usually the other mexican folk um yeah, the 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 
the people of a darker complexion were more likely to to hang out with them, whereas the more fair skinned, lighter skinned um, uh, Asian folk would would sort of stick to their own more or less. Oh yeah, for sure. I just think that's very interesting because like Vietnamese people, in my opinion, often have like no filter. I used to be talked like shit in front of a lot by like other Vietnamese people in Vietnamese, even though I know Vietnamese too. So it was just always like an awkward situation. But I knew a person like with you know Mexicans I grew up with, they were a lot more friendly and open. Uh, in my personal opinion, I don't think it's because of skin color, but I think it's more just like personality. Because I do know Vietnamese people are more of the judgmental type. So I think it also has to do a lot more, not just skin color, but also culture. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely it does. All of this ties into the concept of race. So let's talk about that real quick. Um, and that's going to be the, the last thing that we that we set the stage of the semester with. So what is race then? If race is not just about a skin tone, what is it? Social categorization, really. <laughs> there's, based there's, on? Uh, based on a variety of factors, I guess, political. Such as? Poli P political factors, economic factors, social factors. Um, there's no biological merit to race. You know, everyone is more or less, I mean, we're all human basically at the end of the day. Um, so it, it, it usually comes down to those factors of, of economics and uh, politics and, and things of that nature. Right, so we can start there, right? Um, what else is race? So we have these external factors that are put onto folks, right? But race doesn't work if those external factors are not reciprocated, right? So there's stereotypes that are associated, there's expectations that's associated. Think about, think about your race, right? How you have learned and have been taught to identify racially. What are the social expectations that the world has of you? To me, being African American, they don't have any expectations of us. Oh no, no, no! They sure do. They no, have some, but not like there's expectations. There's expectations for us to. To me, let me see. Let me make it sure I'm saying it correctly. Let me think about it again because I was about to blurt out some stuff. So let me think. No, about that's it. that's what I no. want you to do. Blurt it out. <laughs> no, because we know what sure. it is. We know what it is. We know what it. We know how it functions, and we know how it feels. But we're too afraid to really say it. We know what, what is expected of us. I, I think if I can jump in, at least uh, with, with, with my experience being biracial, uh, my dad's black, my mom's white. Um, I know throughout schooling, a, a lot of my friends attributed whatever positive aspects I have or, or any sort of positive accomplishments with, with, with whiteness or with, with being white or having a white mom. And well, usually like any type of like uh, uh, physical accomplishments or negative or ne negative like stereotypes was almost always associated with with blackness or you know having a black parent. So right, those same expectations, those same stereotypes, those are embedded into our racial identifications too. Those are the expectations of us. So it's expected that you're going to do well and you're going to get a good job and you're going to understand Silicon Valley and, and have uh, Bitcoins and all of that if you are closely associated with whiteness. If you're closely associated with another racialized category though, all of those start to play a, a role. So even down to what we're, what we're expected to eat, right? Black folks are expected to eat fried chicken and watermelon, yep. right? I mean, that's, that's literally embedded within our racial categorization at this point, because that's the social expectation. So when we go into meetings and things, and they don't know what to give us, so they've got a, a tray of watermelon, right? Or they, they're planning an event, and they're getting the KFC ready. Wasn't that the reason is this <laughs> I think that could they, be wrong. they were one. They yeah. were they're not the best. <laughs> okay. Well, that's part of it too, right? So imagine like being part of these social categorizations and doing something different, right? How many times you get the, the look like, wow, that's, 
that's so amazing. It's not really amazing. It's just different from the expectation. So like when I tell folks that I'm vegan, like black people are vegan. Sure. I mean, it's on the rise, of course. Right. Why? Because we're socially becoming more health conscious and all of that. Well, that's not embedded into our racial expectation. You get where we're going with this? It's like when people are shocked to see people of color in position and like roles that are used to be mainly for like white people. So like yes. when Barack Obama became president, it was like people were so confused. It was like there's no way a person of color can be in such a big position because it's not embedded in what they think a black person should do. And that goes for women as well. Yeah. There's... Yes this social construct of like women are supposed to stay home women are supposed to be like sit quietly and not talk back kind of how it was before but now it's like women can do things that men can do as well and it's like we don't have to stay quiet anymore and can do roles that men can do as well yes so the same way that uh, race has been socially constructed gender has also been socially constructed and so what you're starting to do is draw parallels Right, you're starting to um, think about and critically engage some of these concepts, and that's going to be the key to dismantling some of these different systems. So, like when people think about what a teacher looks like, uh, for those of you who have never met me before, tell me your thoughts. Am I what you expected? No, because most of what my other professors are like in an office with like their laptops and like their screen shared and they're like professionally not dressed but like it's not it's not like a shirt it's like they have this professional what expectation of what you think a teacher is and it's not always the case because like i know that some of my teachers in high school had tattoos and they were visibly like seen on their arms and I guess that's not seen as like, oh, a teacher shouldn't have tattoos visible or like they should dress professionally. Sure. Yeah. Oh. Teachers are also expected to be, no offense, older as well. Trust me, I'm not going to take any offense. Can, can I add on to this? Um, please, please I, go. I expected like um, this professor to be like white, just in like in the sense that like, most professors are like older and whiter because mm -hmm. like college and universities weren't meant for like black and brown like students or like black and brown like faculty and stuff which adds on to what Evelyn said like you um are more like lenient and like not like not professional but like most like professors tend to use like high vocabulary or like more advanced vocabulary and that's all like adding on to the fact that like um like universities and stuff weren't meant for like black and brown people and like this sense of like having like advanced vocabulary is like um to allow for like white students and stuff to like have um I'm sorry I lost my train of thought um to have like access to these like places and stuff like it's it's just like you know you expect like um these places to be like more white dominated because they weren't like meant for like us. Right, yeah, usually people expect me to be an older white guy, even in the Africana studies department, right? They expect me to be an older white guy. Um, they expect that even though I have quite the vocabulary, I don't use a lot of it because it's not accessible to my students. It doesn't help you if you can't understand me. It helps you more to hear me speak however I speak because then you feel more comfortable and you feel more confident in the space, right? Think about when you had your first instructor who looked and or sounded like you. Like I had my first black teacher when I was in eighth grade. Fucking changed my life, changed my life, right? Never did I imagine that we could be in, in these kinds of positions. Now, didn't lead me to wanna be a teacher. We'll talk about that a whole nother day. But think about that for yourself, right? When was that pivotal moment when someone, you saw someone in a position where you didn't expect to see someone like that or hear someone who sounds like you and they're succeeding or, or whatever that, that idea of success looks like for them, right? 
I feel like it helps you, like, as a teacher, dressed all, like, cool and stuff or, like, not what we think of as a professor because you kind of mentioned the, like, the high vocabulary and stuff and, like, other teachers kind of, like, being super strict, like, oh, do this, that. Like, you're in a classroom setting. I read the syllabus and it was, like, you can be in a bed, a car, whatever, just as long as, like, you're here and learning. I feel like that makes us as students feel more comfortable with you because we can see that you were like here to learn from you and like a person, a person, like there's no barrier or like of you're the, I'm the professor and you're the student. It's like, we're all just like one big group learning. Like you learn from us and we learn from you, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And it's not like that barrier that divides the professor and the, te and the student. I don't know. It makes me feel more comfortable yeah. with you as a student. Right, absolutely. Whereas you're gonna go into, into some of your other classes and you're not gonna ask questions because you're gonna feel like, like shamed almost, right? You feel shamed if you don't get to ask questions or if you don't understand something, right? And so we just don't. Whereas if you are coming into a space where you feel and you know that the people around you are just like you, right? You're more willing to engage. I saw, uh, Lindsay, I saw your hands up. Um, yeah, I wanted to add on that you um, made the environment feel more comfortable because you actually wanted to hear like how our day was and mm -hmm. wanted to have our opinion because most teachers, they just come on Zoom and they tell you like, okay, so we're going to do this, this, and they tell you schedule and they don't like ask how, how are you feeling or how's your day going and stuff like that, which makes yeah. the environment more like friendly and better. Yeah. Just, you know, like, this is a classroom of, of people of color. This is a classroom of minoritized folks. This is a classroom of differently gendered people. Everybody's coming to this space with something. Everybody's going through something. And so that was the point in the first post, right? To acknowledge that everyone is coming from somewhere different and everyone has overcome something different, but to also acknowledge that through overcoming those things, we have all come together now, right? We've gotten to a point where we've been able to get to to this space. And so how do we move from this space forward? How do we move ourselves forward, right? How do we continue to, to liberate ourselves and to learn as a community? Learning is a lifelong process. If your professors are not interested in learning, they're shitty professors. You can quote me on that. Okay, so um, the last thing I like to do before we get out, I like to um, leave with some affirmations, right? Give us that, that understanding of, listen, we know everyone is going through something, but also we're a community and we can do this together. So somebody start us off. Uh, I like to leave us with three total affirmations before we get out. Um, how are we affirming each other today? What do you wanna leave your peers with? Give us a good word. Uh, I want to leave my peers with motivation for today. Go ahead. What's the motivation? The motivation. Uh, so I have to like elaborate a little bit more and just like give a little. Because I'm not really just, sure like just what like a little just a little affirmation. So so what an affirmation is um, in regards to this is uh, a positive word to keep everyone moving forward for the week until we meet next. Okay. Uh, I think for affirmation for everyone, I think that everyone can do it. I know it might be scary for the first week or two for school, but it'll get better as we like learn to adapt it overall. Excellent. Excellent. That's a great way to start. Thank you. Let's get two more. What are we leaving our peers with? That it's okay to be scared. Like like Kevin said, it's the first week, but I feel like we have a good community and the more we dive into other topics, we'll have more like deeper and longer conversations. Absolutely, absolutely, good one. Okay, I love how deep y'all are getting already. Like you're just, you're so ready to be a community and I love it. I just wanna say that me personally, I'm very shy. I don't like really talk. So I've talked more today on this Zoom than I probably do on in class. So you guys are really giving me like, you know, vibes are cool. You as a listening to your syllabus, 
I was like, oh, she's going to be with it. She's going to be, you, you maybe want to like really join the class. Cause I was thinking about, oh, I'm going to drop this, drop it and get another class, start, another, start again. But you guys really made me feel like comfortable and more at ease. So I think it's going to get better as I go along. Like I said, it's been a minute since I've been in school, but you guys, thank you. Oh, I love that. I love that. All right. Well, thank you all for sharing those. Um, I will leave you with this. Um, understand that we are all at different points and that nobody's path is ever going to be the same. So whether you are here just fresh out of high school or you're returning years later, you are exactly where you're supposed to be right now. So don't let anyone else's journey tell you different. You're where you're supposed to be and we're going to keep moving forward together. All right. So with that, um, I'll have your week two posts up uh, within the next hour. So you'll be able to see that. If y'all have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me, um, but reach out through the group chat if you have any like specific questions about the class, about the prompt, that kind of thing. Because again, just in case I can't answer or if I'm not available and somebody else has access to that answer for you, it's a community. You don't have to wait for me, it's the best part. Um, otherwise, I hope that y'all have a wonderful week. I hope that this was a good start for y'all. I hope we had a, a good dialogue together. I'm excited about it for sure. Um, and we're going to have a wonderful semester. So power through, y'all. I'll see y'all next week. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Oh, thank you, for going thank you Professor. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You're welcome. Bye, y'all. Oh, uh, Professor. Yes.